Shalom Havarim. Uh, we received a, uh, a question. Um, uh, one of our Ask the Rebbe questions. Um, concerning a passage of Zohar. Uh, the passage is, is found in um, volume 3, pages 288a. Barely starts in, at the end of 288a. And then it continues through 288b. And the question had to do if, um, if this passage, which I will read to you in a moment, has anything to do with the three pillars of the Godhead. So before I continue, um, we're going to be discussing uh, this. We're going to be discussing uh, uh, a very important related issue uh, as to the concept of Ein Sof and why the Messiah is not Ein Sof and um, how this relates to uh, the questions of Avodah Zarah and idolatry <clears throat> and uh, clear up some misconceptions that result from some ambiguities and uh, uh, etc. But I want to encourage everybody to please uh, donate to support this work. Uh, we are, as you know, um, a unique ministry, a unique uh, area of teaching, and um, there's really uh, uh, nothing quite like this. But we uh, depend entirely upon you for our support and uh uh, there's a lot of people out there that don't want to have anything to do with supporting uh, this, either because it's too Jewish or it's too Messianic or whatever. So uh, um, we have a special, but I think very important niche, and I need, uh, we need uh, those that um, uh, can and are willing to support this work to please stand up and support this work. Um, donations have been very low in, uh, in the recent, in the last uh, couple of months, frankly, and uh, we are behind and uh, facing some serious problems financially. So please consider donating, and you can do that by PayPal to donations at wnae.org or uh, by clicking on the uh, link to donate in the video description. All right, now let's get on to the good stuff. Um, so the passage of Zohar in question uh, reads as follows, and it's, it, we, do have, we do have some uh, notes for this uh, teaching, but this isn't in the notes. You can look it up in the Zohar if you like. Um, but the, uh, some of our explanation material will, uh, will be in the notes. So um, the passage in question starts, as I said, at the, uh, the very end of page 287, um, I'm sorry, 288A, uh, and then continues into 288B. It says, three heads are engraved, one within the other, one above the other, one head is concealed wisdom, covered and unopened. This concealed wisdom is head of all heads of all other wisdoms. The supernal head is the holy ancient one concealed of all concealed, the head of all heads. Uh, then picking up on page 288b, a head that is not a head, it is unknown and unknowable, what is inside this head, since it can be grasped by neither wisdom nor understanding. To this is applied, flee to your place, uh, Numbers 2411, the living beings dart back and forth, Ezekiel 114, therefore the Holy Ancient One is called Ain, nothingness, since Ain depends upon it. Um, and we could go on, but I think that's that's enough of this. Um, the uh, so the problem with this passage, the reason it's come up is I've seen this passage cited before, 
And uh, believe it or not, there are those who will uh, quote the Zohar or misquote the Zohar, and, uh, let the, quote the Zohar out of context um, in order to support their um, agenda. And as I have made very clear in the past and in my use of things and in my past videos, I do not like to take, in fact, I do not take things out of context. And um, you may recall in the video I did recently on the resurrected Messiah, uh, it was very clear to take the passage about the Messiah uh, uh, being the uh, fallen tabernacle of David that is raised up and in context of the resurrection by taking the Gemara in context of the Mishnah of which it was Gemara uh, to indicate that the raising up was resurrection. And um, uh, that's, that, that's a good example of taking the passage in context. This is a pa an example of, um, frankly, uh, I suspect it started with some Christian apologist reading this and seeing the number three and their eyes lit up three, you know, and uh, 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 they saw an allusion to the Christian Trinity in this passage. And... Um, that's unfortunate because um, the Christian Trinity is a essentially a misunderstanding of the three pillars of the Godhead, and um, that's what it, it it has its origin in. And the three pillars of the Godhead have nothing to do with this passage. Uh, <clears throat> so let me explain what this passage is, first of all. This passage is in a very deep and mysterious uh, portion of the Zohar called the Idra Rabbah. The Idra Rabbah is Rabbi Shimon's dying words, uh, to a certain extent, a, a last speech, if you will, a last teaching that is an explanation of another portion of the Zohar called the Itra Zuta which is itself a interpretation um, or explanation of a, another portion of the Zohar, which is called the, the Sifra uh, uh, Dedzinuta, which is the concealed book. Okay, or the book of concealment. Uh, this section is chap is uh, volume two, pages 176b through 179a. If you want to look for the Idra Rabbah, that's chapter three, or sorry, book three, uh, volume three, uh, pages 127b through 145a. And then the Idra Zuta is uh, volume three, pages 287 through 296b. Okay. So the, the Idra Zutra is a uh, explanation of the Idra Rabbah. The Idra Rabbah, but it's still very uh, concealed and very difficult. It's very um, deep and uh, metaphorical and uh, hidden symbology. And the Idra Rabbah is also an explanation of the Sifra Zeniuta, uh, which is the concealed book, which is um, a very mystical, a very um, uh, metaphorical um, portion of Zohar. It doesn't cite any authorities. It's a, a very uh, um, allegorical, uh, abstract interpretation of the first six chapters of Genesis. And um, the Idra Rabbah inter attempts to interpret it but still in a very uh, uh, mystical, metaphorical, deep, hard to understand way. And then the Idra Zuta does the same uh, from that. So trying to explain, the, really get in depth in studying this passage uh, would involve first going all the way back to the, uh, uh, the Book of Concealment, and then uh, uh, in light of the Idra Rabbah, 
and then that in light of what this is saying in the Idra, the Zutra. But the, the point is, uh, without going into all of that, which would be um, a whole series of, of videos uh, of very deep teaching, it is sufficient to show here that the passage in question, one of the three heads is described here is, is um, it says, it is unknown and unknowable what is inside this head since it can be grasped by neither wisdom nor understanding. Uh, this, uh, um, and then it says, therefore the holy ancient one is called Ayan or Ain. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, at least one of these three heads that's being described here is Ain Sof. And then one is understood uh, as from the commentaries, and if you really understand what is happening through these three sections of Sohar, elaborating on all the way back on the Book of Concealment, is um, Kiter and then Chachma. Uh, the uh, the three heads are generally understood as the uh, the brain on the inside, the cranium on the outside, and then everything on the outside of the cranium uh, being more or less the infinite universe. Um, and that representing Ain Sof. Okay. Um, then the cranium uh, representing Kiter and the, the, the brain of the ancient one in the symbolic imagery representing Chachma or wisdom. This has nothing to do with the three pillars of the Godhead. You can go back and watch my videos that I've done on the middle pillar and the three pillars of the Godhead, uh, and you'll see that they have nothing to do with this. In fact, um, Ein Sof is very, very distinct from the three pillars because the three pillars are aspects of, uh, not of Ein Sof directly, but of the image of Elohim. And this is very important to address because there is some confusion. Part of that confusion is uh, uh, the main line of Christianity where the uh, three pillars were misunderstood and ultimately transformed into the Christian Trinity. Um, and by well-meaning Messianic Jews who um, uh, take the uh, three pillars and try and interpret them as the Christian Trinity rather than to interpret the Christian Trinity as a misunderstanding of the three pillars. A misunderstanding that, frankly, leads ultimately to idolatry. And the uh, significant points that we're going to point out uh, and study and understand is why our understanding uh, of the three pillars and of uh, uh, the deity of Messiah is not idolatry because we are not saying Messiah is Ein Sof. That would be idolatry. So let's understand, let's get to our handouts. Our first handout is titled, Ein Sof Revealed by the Word. Now, I've done other videos that explored this first portion, the word revealed in the Zohar, and uh, I've done blogs on this, and I think I've done videos on it. Pretty sure I have. Um, and uh, going through and interpreting this uh, portion of Zohar, that takes place in the uh, preface of the Zohar, before the Zohar begins uh, discussing each of the, uh, well, becomes Torah commentary, okay? So this is on, um, let's see, page citation, Zohar, volume one, page one, <laughs> B, so, uh, but still page one, B, through 2a. This is how introductory this is in the Zohar. And why is this so introductory in the Zohar? Because it's foundational to the whole context and topic of the Zohar. 
Okay. So Rabbi Shimon said, well, let, let me give a brief introduction to this. So Rabbi Eliezer, who is um, Shimon Bar Yochai, his son, Shimon Bar Yochai, is the traditional author of the Zohar. And I, I would maintain the author of the core material of the Zohar. Uh, I'm not saying that later authors didn't have their hands on it, um, uh, but uh, uh, that, that's another issue. So uh, uh, Rabbi Eliezer has been giving this uh, uh, exposition on the passage, Lift Your Eyes on High and See Who Created Thee. Uh, which is Isaiah 40, verse 26. And his father, uh, Bar Yochai, interrupts him and says this. Rabbi Shimon said, Eliezer, my son, cease your words. In other words, shut up. <laughs> so that the concealed mystery on high and known to any uh, human may be revealed. So you'll shut up for a minute. You'll learn something. <laughs> okay. The Rabbi Eliezer was silent, he honored his father, and he shuts his mouth. He stops his exposition right there. Rabbi Shimon wept and paused for a moment. Then he said, Eliezer, what is these? In the, 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 the term these in the, uh, in the passage, lift your eyes on high and see who created these in Isaiah 40, 26. So he said, Eliezer, what is these? What is these, Ele? If you answer stars and constellations, they're always visible there and were created by Ma, by what? As it is said, by the word, or Devar in Hebrew, by the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made. Psalm 33, 6. Now this reference to the word becomes all important here. As for things concealed, such would not be referred to as these, for that word indicates something revealed. The mystery was only revealed one day when I was at the seashore. Eliyahu came and asked me. So this is then uh, Shimon is telling his son that uh, Elijah came to him uh, the prophet Elijah, who was taken up in a fiery chariot, okay, um, so he's still alive, uh, he came to him. Elijah came and asked me, Rabbi, do you know the meaning of who created these? Um, again, back to our passage, Isaiah 40, 26. I answered, these are the heavens and their array, the work of the blessed Holy One. Human beings should contemplate them and bless him, as it is written, when I beheld, beheld your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place. Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. Uh, Psalms 8, verses 4 and verse 10. Eliyahu said to me, The word or in Aramaic, milah, but in Hebrew, earlier it was devar in Hebrew because it was quoting Psalm 33, 6. Eliezer said to me, Rabbi, the word was concealed with the blessed Holy One, and he revealed it in the academy on high. Here it is. So the word is concealed, and it's with the blessed Holy One. Um and he revealed it in the academy on high. So Eliyahu, when he was taken up in the fiery chariot, he, he was taught in the yeshiva in heaven, okay? Um, the academy on high. So here's what he learned in this, in this heavenly yeshiva, if you will. When the concealed of all concealed wished to be revealed, what is the concealed of all concealed? Well, as we're going to find out, I'll, I'll pause and explain here. It is Ein Sof. So what is Ein Sof? I've been using this term Ein Sof. What does Ein Sof mean? Um, Ein Sof is a term that is used in Judaism to refer to Elohim in his infinite 
state infinite aspect. Ain Sof literally means ain, means without, or there is not, and Sof means border or definition. So Ain Sof is without border, without definition, infinite. Okay? Uh, Ain Sof means infinite, essentially, the infinite one. Uh, this uh, raises a very uh, important point in Judaism, and that is that um, uh, the minute we start trying to define Elohim, or define Ein Sof, if you will, the infinite one, we're no longer talking about the infinite one because the infinite one is beyond definition. We can't even comprehend the infinite one. We can't even have a relationship with the infinite one because we can't understand the infinite one because the infinite one We'd have to have an infinite number of bytes in our brain to even begin to comprehend the infinite one. So the infinite one we can't really talk about. Uh, and the minute we start talking about uh, Elohim and trying to define Elohim, we're really no longer talking about Ein Sof. So we can say that Ein Sof is infinite, uh, but that's just about all we can say, really, about Ein Sof. Okay, so... Back to our passage, when the concealed of all concealed wished to be revealed, it produced at first a single point, which ascended to become thought. Within it drew all drawings, graved all engravings, carving them within the concealed holy lamp, a graving of one hidden design. So, from other passages of the Zohar, we know that this, this lamp refers to the ten sephirot, um, uh, and I'm, under, I'm assuming that you have some comprehension of Kabbalah 101, but the ten sephirot are the are ten emanations uh, of finite aspects of Elohim that proceed from Ein Sof. Let's keep it okay. So uh, within it drew all drawings, graved all engravings, carving them within the concealed holy lamp, a graving of one hidden design, holy of holies, a deep structure emerging from thought called me, being the Hebrew word for who. Me. Who, or origin of structure, existent and non-existent, deep and hidden, called by no name but who. Seeking to be revealed, to be named, it garbed itself in a splendid, radiant garment. Remember that word, radiant, garment, and created ele, these. So remember our passage in Isaiah 40, 26, who created these? Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, and created these. These, ele, that's the Hebrew word for these, attained the name. These letters joined with those. In other words, Eleh joined the words Aleph, Lamed, He, Eleh, joined with the letters Mem, Yud, Me, and uh, all of these are the, are the letters for the word Elohim, which we translate God. Okay, attained the name. These letters joined those culminating in the name Elohim until it created Eleh. Eleh, it did not attain the name Elohim. Uh, until it created Eleh, it did not attain the name Elohim. In other words, it wasn't even what we comprehend as Elohim yet. Based on this mystery, those who sinned with the golden calf said, Eleh, these are your gods, O Israel. Um, Exodus 32, 8. In other words, it's saying, ah, even in their folly, they actually were speaking a sort of truth here. Just as me is combined with Ele, so the name Elohim remained for all time, and upon the mystery, the, upon this mystery, the world is built. Then Elijah flew off. It did not see him. Uh, uh, I did not see him. From him I discovered the word. So he credits Eliyahu with revealing to him the word, or Milah, whose mysterious secret I have demonstrated. Rabbi Eliezer and all of his companions came and prostrated themselves before him 
weeping for joy and saying, if we had come into the world only to hear this, we should have been content. This is the glorious introduction to the Zohar. <laughs> it's uh, all about the revelation of uh, the, uh, uh, the word as a finite expression of Ein Sof, the concealed of concealed. The word is therefore the same as the Ten Sephirot, okay? Uh, it is the, uh, the, 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 the word is a finite expression of Ein Sof, which is the concealed of concealed. Let us continue. Our next handout is titled Ein Sof and the Image of Elohim. So, uh, first we have a quote from the Sefer Yitzirah. The Sefer Yitzirah is a very early Kabbalistic work, um, uh, traditionally ascribed to, to Avraham, um, but uh, also to uh, later authors of the first century uh, and so on. The, uh, the, the important thing is that it's a very, very early work probably dating at least to the first century, and uh, so early that it's actually attributed to Avraham. Okay. Um, chapter 1, verse 7 of the Sefer Yitzrah, which is also very uh, metaphorical. It says, Ten Sephirot of nothingness. So it's talking about these ten Sephirot. Their end is embedded in their beginning, and their beginning in their end like a flame in a burning coal. For Adon is singular. Adon is the Hebrew word for Lord, uh, uh, is singular. He has no second, and before one, what do you count? So this is emphasizing that the uh, monotheism, that it's emphasizing that there's only one Elohim, but that the ten sephirot, which are these... Uh, 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 a garment in which uh, Elohim expresses himself, through which Ain Sof expresses himself in a finite form for us that we can comprehend, if you will, um, is embedded in Ain Sof in the same way that the flame coming from the coal is embedded in the coal there, that you can't have um, a burning coal without the flame. You can have a coal, but you can't have a burning coal without the flame and the flame proceeds from the coal, and you can't have the flame without the coal. Okay. Uh, so that th this is the kind of relationship that is being explained. Now the Zohar then elaborates on this teaching <clears throat> from the Sefer Yitzirah, and the, the, uh, the in-depth student would understand uh, 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 especially the early students of the Zohar would understand that it's referring back, they would you know, immediately recall the Sefer Yitzhara passage that's being referred to here. The Holy One, blessed be he, this is Zohar, volume 3, page 70b. <clears throat> the Holy One, blessed be he, has produced ten holy crowns, this is obviously the ten sephirot, above wherewith, he crowns and invests himself, and he is they, and they are he, he being linked together like the flame and the coal. So according to the Zohar here, the flame and the coal relationship that's being referred to in the Sefer Yitzirah is telling us that the ten sephirot, or the ten holy crowns, if you will, um, with which he invests himself, he is they, and they are he. Um, they uh, uh, And uh, this is what the Sefer Yitzhara means when it says, the end is embedded in their beginning, and their beginning in their end, like a flame burning from coal. Okay. So let's look at what um, a, a, a well-known Kabbalah scholar named Gershom Shalom writes about this passage of Zohar. Gershom Sholem, by the way, to let you know who he, he was, he uh, um, wrote several books and articles 
was probably, he was definitely, almost certainly, the world's leading expert on Kabbalah in his lifetime. And one of the books that he, um, one of the things that he wrote, in fact, was the Encyclopedia Judaica article on Kabbalah. And he wrote most of the, if not all of the Encyclopedia Judaica articles on uh, subjects related to Kabbalah. Um, and there's actually a book published separately called Kabbalah by Gershom Sholem, which is all of the articles that he wrote uh, for the Encyclopedia Judaica. Uh, the, the main part of the book is the article on Kabbalah, and then it's followed up by other articles on related topics that he wrote. He also wrote several other books and articles on the subject. So anyway, very, very uh, well-known, eminent, authoritative scholar. So he writes this um, in his book, Kabbalah, page 101, which I mentioned to you, which means it's also actually, uh, I don't have the page number, but in his uh, article on Kabbalah in the Encyclopedia Judaica. It says, most of the early Kabbalists were more inclined to accept the view that the Sephirot were actually identical with God's substance or essence. This is stated in many documents from the 13th century and stressed later in the school of Rabbi uh, Solomon ben Adret, and particularly in the uh, Ma'arakhet Ha Elohut, which was followed in the 16th century by David Messer Lyon, uh, Mir Ibn Gabiyah, and Joseph Caro. Uh, according to this view, the Sephirot, <clears throat> excuse me, according to this view, the Sephirot do not constitute intermediary beings, but are God himself. The emanation is the divinity, while Ain Self cannot be subject to religious investigation, which can be, uh, uh, which can conceive God of only, of only in his external aspect. The main part of the Zohar also tends largely towards this opinion, expressing it emphatically in the interchangeable identity of God with his names or his powers. Quote, he is they, and they are he, Zohar volume 3, pages 11b and 70a, and uh, 70b perhaps, we, we quoted chapter 3, verse 70 above. Um, where that occurs. Okay, so um, that is Gershom Sholem. He is saying that this passage of Zohar is is uh, understood by the early Kabbalists at least to mean that um, the Sephirot are identical with God's substance or essence, uh, even though Ein Sof cannot really be investigated or talked about. This is an uh, important because as Gershom Sholem is indicating, this opinion changed, and in la later Kabbalists in uh, rabbinic Judaism rejected this idea uh, that they were uh, uh, that the ten sephirot were actually identical with God's substance or essence. But early Kabbalists held the view that they were, and this is what the Zohar is saying uh, that we quoted above in reference to the passage in Sefer Yitzhak that we quoted above that. Okay, so now let's look at what Arya Kaplan uh, explains uh, on this passage in his commentary to the Sefer Yitzhak. He wrote a, a very good commentary to the Sefer Yitzhak. He was, uh, I got it right here. Um, and uh, uh, it contains the entire Sefer Yitzhak in Hebrew and in English, with um, variant uh, manuscripts in, in Hebrew and English in the back, and with Arya Kaplan's commentary. Arya Kaplan was a Hasidic Jew, um, I believe he was Breslov, and he actually uh, was also very knowledgeable. He was a physicist who left physics to uh, further his studies in Kabbalah, and he wrote uh, this commentary and also this uh, similar book that is on the Bahir, uh, uh, English 
in Hebrew, the Bahir with his commentary. Okay, good stuff. Um, so uh, Arya Kaplan's very authoritative source, um, uh, uh, one of my favorite authors on the topic. He says, the Sefer Yitzhara, on page 57 of his book, he's commenting on the passage above uh, in Sefer Yitzhara 1.7. And he says, the Sefer Yitzhara likens this to a flame found bound to a burning coal. A flame cannot exist without the coal, and the burning coal cannot exist without the flame, because it wouldn't be a burning coal. Um, although the coal is the cause of the flame, the flame is also the cause of the burning coal. Uh, without the flame, there would not be a burning coal, since cause cannot exist without effect. Effect is also the cause of cause. So, and sort of a cycle here. Um, this is uh, uh, Sefer Yitzra, the Book of Creation, or Arya Kaplan, page 57. Elsewhere in the same book, on pages 7 through 8, Arya Kaplan addresses uh, the issue of Ein Sof versus the image of Elohim. Arya Kaplan writes, In general, none of the names of God refer to Ein Sof which means the infinite being, or simply the infinite. Pause here. Uh, you'll notice that he spells Ein Sof with an A instead of an E. Uh, there are different spellings of Ein Sof in English. There's E-I-N, E-Y-N, A-I-N, and A-Y-N. Uh, any of those are um, different spellings that are used for Ein Sof, uh, but it's the same Hebrew word, Ein Sof. So it says, Ein Sof, which means the infinite being, or simply the infinite, the names used in scripture and elsewhere merely refer to the various ways through which God manifests himself in creation. Uh, the name Elohim, which is used throughout the first chapter of Genesis, refers to the manifestation of delineation and definition. That is the significance to the Torah's statement that Elohim, or God, formed man in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. Note that the word God here is Elohim. This is because man parallels the delineating forces that define creation. So what we're learning here from uh, what Arya Kaplan is telling us, and uh, let me kind of elaborate and explain, is that uh, when the Torah talks about the image of Elohim, um, it's not talking about Ein Sof. Um, and the, the, there's a distinction between what the Torah calls the image of Elohim and Ein Sof. But the reality is that when we, when we speak and when we read, and in the, even in the text of the Torah and the, and the, the Nach, the, the, t the entirety of the Tanakh, um, uh, we... Uh, see interchangeably Ein Sof and the image of Elohim referred to as Elohim or by the different names of Elohim and different titles of Elohim. Um, let me explain this, illustrate this for you. Imagine that you and I um, are in a museum. And we're both looking at a picture of George Washington. And I point at it and I say to you, hey, that's George Washington. And then you look at me like some sort of smarty pants and point at it and says, no, that's only the image of George Washington. Well, the sense we're both right. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, we would refer to the image of George Washington as, well, that's George Washington. In reality, it's really only the image of George Washington. Well, the Torah is written in the same way. The Tanakh is written in the same way. And this is why there's sometimes passages that tell us that we can't see Ein Sof and other passages that talk about, I mean, that we can't see Elohim and other passages that talk about Elohim being seen. And that's because um, one is talking about Ein Sof and one is talking about, the other is talking about the image of Elohim. So now let's talk about, on our next handout, the Messiah 
as the image of Elohim. The Messiah is portrayed in the Ketuvim Netzarim as the word or the image of Elohim. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Messiah, who is the image of Elohim. Colossians 1.15 says, who is the image of the invisible Elohim. And Hebrews 1.3, who is the radiance, or Zohar, of his glory and the image of his being. And remember, at the opening of the Zohar, it referred to this garment uh, that uh, uh, the concealed Elohim expresses self through as radiant. And then uh, Yochanan 1.14, which is a follow-up of John 1 through 4, uh, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory of his only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yochanan 1.14. Okay, so the, uh, the concept of who the Messiah is being expressed in the Ketuvim Netzarim is that of the image of Elohim, not Ein Sof. Um, the next handout page, it's actually two pages long, is Philo's word as the image of Elohim. And um, it's not necessary to read through all of these. They're here for your reference. Um, but we'll simply say that Philo very clearly identified the word of Elohim with what he called the logos in uh, his, in Greek, which he wrote, which is the Greek word for word. And I think we've done videos and we may do more on the future. I think, we, yes, in fact, I know we did on the three pillars, on the middle pillar, uh, uh, showing Philo's concept of the logos or word and how it uh, parallels with the concept of the Nimra in the Targums and in uh, uh, the Zohar, the Nimra. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the last handout is titled The Word as the Messiah. And uh, this shows, this handout is kind of just to tie some things up. We could go into such, so much more in depth, but uh, it beyond the scope of what we're trying to get to here. That uh, the Targum Jonathan to Isaiah chapter 42 verses 1 through 4 identify the word as the Messiah, and if we look up, we'll also find the uh, the term, the word, you, uh, the Mimra, used interchangeably as Elohim in the Targums, as uh, Yahweh. Behold, my servant, this is uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4 in the Targum. The Targum is the Aramaic paraphrase, um, in this case Targum Jonathan, that was read uh, for Aramaic speakers that, uh, at the, in the Torah readings and whatnot to give an explanation. Uh, they were paraphrased and therefore gave a great deal of explanation of understanding of what the ancients understood Isaiah, in this case, to mean. Behold my servant, the Messiah, whom I bring, my chosen in whom one delights. As for my word, I will put my Holy Spirit upon him, and if we look at the Mesoretic text, it's clearly the servant is the Messiah, is therefore the word here, or the Memra. As for my Memra, or my word, I will put my spirit upon him. He shall reveal my judgment unto the nations. He shall not cry aloud, nor raise a clamor. He shall not lift up his voice in the streets. The meek who are like a bruised reed, he shall not break. The poor who are a glimmering wick with him, he will not quench. He will bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not faint nor be weary till he has established judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his Torah. In Philo of Alexandria, likewise, I identified the word, or in, his, in Greek, he would say the logos, with the Messiah in questions, on, uh, questions and answers on Exodus uh, 2. 117, he says, the head of all things as is the eternal word or logos of the eternal God under which, as it were, his feet or other limbs is placed the whole world over which he passes 
and firmly stands. Now it is not because the Messiah is Lord that he passes and sits over the whole uh, world for his seat with his Father and God, but because it is perfect fullness, the world is in need of the care and super, uh, uh, superintendence of the best ordered dispensation, and for its own complete piety, the divine word, or logos, just as living creatures need a head without which it is impossible to live. So, um, the first century Jewish philosopher, uh, Philo of Alexandria, understood the word not only as being the image of Elohim, but as being the Messiah. And uh, the, the, uh, the Targum understands the word as being the Messiah. So here we have this distinction. And there's a great deal of confusion around the distinction uh, in the um, primary sources, as I have laid out. <clears throat> so the concept of the deity of Messiah, as laid out in the Ketuvim Netzarim, the writings of the Nazarenes, the so-called New Testament, is that Messiah was the uh, expression of the memra, of the word, um, of the milta in the Peshitta, which is equivalent to milah in the Zohar, and the mimra in the uh, Aramaic of the Targums, and devar in the uh, Psalms. Messiah is specifically described as being the image of Elohim. <clears throat> so the image of Elohim is not the same thing as Ein Sof. Um, so when we're talking about the, the Memra, we're talking about the, or the word, uh, we're talking about the Ten Sephirot. And the, the Ten Sephirot, as we've shown in other videos, are arranged into three columns, which are called in Zohar pillars. And the central pillar is called the Son of Yah in the Zohar, which is, of course, the, uh, the idea that we have of the Messiah. And it is this concept of the, uh, the two outer pillars, father and mother, and the middle pillar being the Son of Yah, that uh, became Christianity's trinity. Uh, but they didn't understand the distinguishment between this and Ein Sof. And uh, uh, the, the very deep distinguishment between this and Ein Sof. Um, so this is not Ein Sof. The Messiah is not Ein Sof. The Son is not Ein The Son of Yah is not Ein Sof. The Father is not Ein Sof. Because the minute we start ascribing characteristics, the minute we say Father, well, Father, for example, isn't a mother. Okay? We start putting definition on Ein Sof, and we're no longer talking about Ein Sof. Now we're starting to talk about the Milah, or the Mimra, the word, the, the Sephirot, the qualities and characteristics that emanate from Ein Sof. So returning to uh, the original uh, Zohar passage that, was, uh, that I was asked, no, that passage has nothing to do with the uh, uh, Messiah or the Son of Yah or the three pillars that are discussed, uh, uh, the so-called three pillars of the Godhead that are discussed in depth in the Zohar that we've addressed before. These are all referring to the image of Elohim, which is distinguished from Ein Sof, which is the infinite one. The Messiah is not the infinite one because that would be a defining the infinite one, and the infinite one has no definition. If one were to say the Messiah was the infinite one, that would be idolatry, okay? Um, but saying that the Messiah is the, uh, the expression of uh, the word or the image of Elohim uh, which is finite and not the infinite one, uh, is not uh, the same thing as saying that the Messiah is Ein Sof, because those are not Ein Sof. A confusion arises because, was as I illustrated with the uh, uh, allegory, if you will, of the art museum, where you and I are standing together and pointing at a painting, 
and talking, and I'm saying that it's uh, uh, George Washington, and you're saying it's only an image of George Washington, uh, because the term Elohim and Yahweh, etc., uh, the uh, the various names of Elohim are used interchangeably to either refer to Ein Sof or to the uh, uh, the image of Ein so of Elohim. Sorry, the image of Elohim. Um, the, then this creates some confusion because when we talk about the deity of the Messiah, uh, we're, we're talking about the Messiah as being the image of Elohim from which we were created, uh, the expression of the Logos made flesh, or the expression of the Memra made, uh, or the Mila in the Zohar made flesh, which is not Ein Sof and not idolatry. So I hope this has been helpful to you in understanding, first of all, that uh, the uh, the passage uh, in uh, Idra Zuta that is not referring to the Messiah or the Trinity or anything of a sort, and that those, unfortunately, that have used it in that way have taken it out of context, because it's not talking about the same thing as the uh, passages that are relevant that are talked about in the Zohar that uh, uh, are talking about the so-called three pillars, of which the Messiah, the Son of Yah, is the middle pillar, and um, uh, of the summation of which the Messiah, being the middle pillar, which brings them all together, is the Mimra, or the Milah. All right, one last time, I want to encourage you to please donate to support this work. Uh, uh, these teachings are, you know, Obviously, hours of research goes into them, and um, uh, frankly, they are the uh, the result of decades of study. Uh, and uh, uh, I share them with you freely, but I need you to please help uh, with your donations uh, to uh, uh, allow us to continue uh, doing this work. So you can do that by sending uh, donations by PayPal to donations at wnae.org or by sending donations to the uh, uh, link at the, uh, in the video description. There's also a link in the video description where you can find the PDF download of the, um, uh, of the handouts for this. Uh, teaching. So uh, um, until next time, shalom, shalom.